And now the second part of the Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie readings. Hugh Laurie lends his inimitable reading talent to five of Jerome K. Jerome's very funny musings about everyday life. The first of his idle thoughts of an idle fellow is appropriately called On Being Idle. Now, being idle is a subject on which I flatter myself I really am au fait. The gentleman who, when I was young, bathed me at Wisdom's font for nine guineas a term, no extras, used to say he never knew a boy who could do less work in more time. Idling always has been my strong point. I take no credit to myself in the matter. It's a gift. Few possess it. There are plenty of lazy people and plenty of slow coaches, but a genuine idler is a rarity. He's not a man who slouches about with his hands in his pockets. On the contrary, his most startling characteristic is that he's always intensely busy. It's impossible to enjoy idling thoroughly unless one has plenty of work to do. There's no fun in doing nothing when you have nothing to do. Wasting time is merely an occupation, then, and a most exhausting one. Idleness, like kisses, to be sweet must be stolen. Many years ago, when I was a young man, I was taken very ill. I never could see myself that much was the matter with me, except that I had a beastly cold. But I suppose it was something very serious, for the doctor said that I ought to have come to him a month before, and that if it, whatever it was, had gone on for another week, he would not have answered for the consequences. It's an extraordinary thing, but I never knew a doctor called into any case yet but what it transpired that another day's delay would have rendered cure hopeless. Our medical guide, philosopher and friend is like the hero in a melodrama. He always comes upon the scene just and only just in the nick of time. It's providence, that's what it is. Well, as I was saying, I was very ill and was ordered to Buxton for a month, with strict injunctions to do nothing whatever all the while that I was there. Rest is what you require, said the doctor. Perfect rest. It seemed a delightful prospect. Ah, this man evidently understands my complaint, said I, and I pictured to myself a glorious time. A four weeks dolce far niente, with a dash of illness in it. Not too much illness, but just illness enough, just sufficient to give it the flavour of suffering and make it poetical. I should get up late, sip chocolate, and have my breakfast in slippers and a dressing gown. I should lie out in the garden, in a hammock, and read sentimental novels with a melancholy ending, until the book would fall from my listless hand, and I should recline there, dreamily gazing into the deep blue of the firmament, watching the fleecy clouds floating like white-sailed ships across its depths, and listening to the joyous song of the birds and the low rustling of the trees. Or, when I became too weak to go out of doors, I should sit, propped up with pillows, at the open window of the ground-floor front, and look wasted and interesting, so that all the pretty girls would sigh as they pass by. And twice a day... I should go down in a bath chair to the colonnade to drink the waters. Oh, those waters! I knew nothing about them then, and was rather taken with the idea. Drinking the waters sounded fashionable and queen anified, and I thought I should like them. But, ugh, after the first three or four mornings, Sam Weller's description of them as having a taste of warm flat irons conveys only a faint idea of their hideous nauseousness. If anything could make a sick man get well quickly, it would be the knowledge that he must drink a glassful of them every day until he was recovered. I drank them neat for six consecutive days, and they nearly killed me. But after then, I adopted the plan of taking a stiff glass of brandy and water immediately on the top of them, and found much relief thereby. I've been informed since by various eminent medical gentlemen that the alcohol must have entirely counteracted the effects of the calibiate properties contained in the water. I'm glad I was lucky enough to hit upon the right thing. But drinking the waters, 
was only a small portion of the torture I experienced during that memorable month, a month which was, without exception, the most miserable I've ever spent. During the best part of it, I religiously followed the doctor's mandate and did nothing whatever, except moon about the house and garden, and go out for two hours a day in a bath chair. That did break the monotony to a certain extent. There's more excitement about bath chairing, especially if you're not used to the exhilarating exercise, than might appear to the casual observer. A sense of danger is ever-present to the mind of the occupant. He feels convinced every minute that the whole concern is going over. Every vehicle that passes he expects is going to run into him, and he never finds himself ascending...